Hi everyone, welcome to the Recruiter Ricky How to Get Hired podcast. Um, in our new series, we've got a, a lineup of very special guests, and today I'm very proud to announce somebody who actually has a really interesting blend in their career. They've got a background in recruitment, which is what I come from. They've set up their own firm. They've been a young entrepreneur, and they are an aspiring, growing entrepreneur as the company goes from strength to strength. So today, I'd like to invite the CEO of the sole supplier company, George Sullivan, to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, George. Ricky, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Um, and that was a really great intro as well. It's probably the best intro about me I've, <laughs> I've heard. Um, yeah, definitely we've experienced some great growth with the sole supplier over the past five years. And we're really now looking to go aggressive for the next three and take what we've developed to help people find footwear internationally. Well, I'm glad you liked the intro. It was great. Um, and I will ask for feedback at the end to see if I could have done that better. <laughs> for you. But where I think it's really, uh, where, I, where I've been excited to meet you is, is not only that, we've actually kind of crossed paths in a career in the past. We've worked for a, an employer that had a merger post me leaving, but we, we know some similar people. Mm. You know the game that I'm coming from. And what I love is seeing great people do well and then almost change careers. Mm. And I think what's really helpful to the audience and everyone that's gonna be listening to us is you've got so many insights, a recruitment person's insight, a leader's insight, someone who hires, someone who fires, we've got to use that word. It's not a dirty word, it's a real word. Yep. Um, and that's where I think your insights will be valuable. But before we look at some of those trips, some of those tricks and tips for everyone, I'd like to find out more about your career. So tell me, you set up the sole supplier company late 2013. Yes. Prior to that, you're in recruitment. So mm. why don't you talk to me a little bit about why you've left one industry to go into another and get that vision set up? Yeah, it's interesting because no one's ever really dug down on that and how I switched. Um, but my story was, I was always into tech when I was growing up. So I always wanted to do something with the web and that was inspired by my dad. Um, but I was also a, a natural salesperson. I, I talked to people, I was sociable, and I just got on with people. So going into a sales job after I left school seemed, seemed right, and I couldn't find that tech business to go into. It just didn't work for me. I couldn't find one. Yeah. Started doing sales and then recruitment, whilst also, when I started earning well, buying a lot of shoes and trainers and collecting a lot, much to my mum and dad's disgust. So what I find really interesting is, yes, you were working in recruitment, you were making money, you could buy trainers. Mm. But to actually turn that into somebody who then wants to leave the job, which is making the money to buy the trainers, which are your passion, yeah. to follow purely the passion, which technically has no money in it from day one. Why were you brave enough to make that switch? A lot of inspiration from my, my dad yeah. and my mum, I guess, pushing me, not pushing me, but in, my dad set up businesses and had failed businesses and successful businesses. I had inspiration there and they were not supportive initially of me leaving work. So leaving, essentially, something that's making you money to something that won't unless it works. Exactly. Um, I didn't leave initially. And my advice to anyone out there, if you've started a business and you're working in a job currently, make sure that business is making you enough money so you can sustain your life. It sounds obvious, yeah. but don't go out on a whim and put pressure on yourself because you're only going to make worse decisions when you're, you've got ultimate pressure. We're making desperate decisions. Desperate decisions, right? So um, it was up nine months after I'd set it up in my mum and dad's uh, spare bedroom when I was living at home at the time, um, I said, look, I'm, I'm gonna leave. I'm making enough money now. I think I had like 20 grand in the bank at the time, or at six to nine months. I said, I've got this money saved, I'm leaving. And I had a car on finance yeah. and they were like, you can't do that, how are you yeah. gonna pay for the car? And I just said, I know it's the right time and I need to put more into this. So at the time going into it, so you followed your passion. Mm. What's great is you fought against the um, the naysayers. I, I, I don't mean to uh, speak badly about family, but at the same time, there are always people that will tell you you can't do it either. You're not good enough. It's not the right time. There's always reasons not to start a firm, but you were strong enough to, yeah. to overcome them and say, I'm going to do this. But at the time of doing it, you followed your passion. Did you think it would be what it is now or, or something different? Because it's hard to see an acorn as a, as a tree. Um, two things there. So my dad was actually risk averse through failures, mm. uh, some failures just bit risk averse, I guess. But he was actually quite supportive, whereas my mum's more traditional. Okay. So you always get the sort of the devil and the angel. Yeah. Um, so it's taking both of those and, and, and moving forward. And there's this whole thing about this 10X principle. Yeah. 
I don't quite like that principle. I will go on record saying I hate it. I hate everyone okay, that cool. talks about 10x all day long. We agree. You might be called Grant Cardone <laughs> or whoever you are. It is boring. It, it's a bit crazy, but the principle there to answer your question is that I didn't see the market potential and my ambitions and my goals kept changing as the business kept growing. Okay. But that principle of 10x is whatever goal you start with, just try and make it bigger. Um, and rather than doing it bit by bit, where do you really want to get to? And mine was just organically setting higher and higher goals, um, growing parts of the business. I never saw it as big as it was. So do you think, uh, I appreciate what you're saying, you yeah. an appetite for growth, an yeah. appetite for always trying to do better than you are. Mm. But you're still going from a perspective that you like trainers. Let, let's not, let's, I'm going to dumb it down a little. You like trainers, but how would you turn that into money? How would you turn that into a business? Because what you're not doing is manufacturing trainers. Yeah. But what... what who did you take inspiration to think, I see how people have done this in other markets, if there is anyone? Yeah, so I always knew I wanted to do something. So I'd read a lot of different books, business books, self-development books, uh, books about the web. Yeah. And I was looking at sites in America to get information um, on when shoes would come out. And they're phoning up shops in the UK. And there wasn't a key place that okay. I could find out that information. So my goal was just to take what those sort of American sites did and make it better and for the UK. I didn't want to just copy what they did. I wanted to make it better. I wanted to offer content for people to learn about shoes, yeah. but also to be able to shop and find all of the retailers where they could buy them from with the best prices. So ideally what you've done is you, your passion stemmed from, you like trainers personally. Yeah. You wanted to find out more about trainers, what was coming out, and you couldn't find a, right. a centralized source of information. So rather than recreating the wheel, you've mm. identified a consumer problem, yep. and you've thought, how can I solve this? Can I turn that into a company? And nine months of doing that while you were working elsewhere to probably prove to yourself that it can be done. Mm. Um, so let's look at what the company is today. We will come back to the journey, sure, but just, sure. I guess just to really hammer home the point of who the sole supplier are to our audience. Um, so we're talking about, if I want to buy shoes, mm. I can go onto your platform. So it's a tech platform ultimately. Yes. I can find out information about trend, I'm gonna I sound like a really old person, trendy, <laughs> yeah. fashionable new shoes that are in the marketplace. That's right. So you're more of a tech company than you are a fashion brand, if I can word it like that. Correct, yeah. I can find out more information about it. And as a result, I can then, you can connect me to places to buy it. So I can get those shoes That's right. through your platform because I've built confidence in the fact that you've given me information that I didn't know before. You've got it perfectly. Okay. Exactly, it's content, search and comparison with links to buy. And when I think about businesses, yeah. I always think tech companies mm. and content sharing, although that sounds simple in principle, it mm. also sounds very expensive to get off the ground and actually work. You can sometimes sink a lot of money into a tech firm to develop it to a platform that consumers find it usable. Mm. How have you overcome that challenge of getting enough money to make it work? It originally wasn't a tech platform. Okay. I set it up as a tool, a blog basically. Yeah. And then very soon I started seeing that if I develop things further and I built an app, for instance, I improved the website, that using that tech I could improve the experience and improve the bottom line for us as well. Um, initially I started with a fund of around 10,000 pounds that okay. I saved up from recruitment and doing other things like selling stuff on eBay. Um, I mentioned the PS4s when they yep. came out, I was reselling them for like two times what they were worth. I made two and a half thousand from selling PS4s. Love it. A bit crazy, yeah. but it worked. So I had my fund and I just set it up organically and taught myself how to set up a site and market it on social. And then I hired some freelancers and that was where things started growing. Well, what's interesting is you've been, what I love to hear is you've been patient. I think everybody these days who, mm. and there'll be people out there listening to this who, who you might be, listen to this podcast because you're looking to find a job or you want to help yourself but sometimes a lot of people also want to set up a company and the principles are transferable mm. um what's nice is you've been patient because it doesn't work overnight you've taken time you've spent time before it getting a seed fund um your own seed fund yeah and you've been agile with your company to to, to change the model slightly to what the market wanted and yeah. eventually you've just reinvested money after money after money to get it to a place now where unless i've got my facts wrong Three and a half million pound turnover company growing yeah. about seventy percent year on year. Yeah, um, over twenty staff and just continually going in the right direction. I mean, your social media platform as a company, Instagram yeah. alone, six hundred thousand plus followers. That's right, I mean, yeah. that's 
not a small fry company in any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, social's so well. huge. Social is a huge element so is that for us. Your, is that where you're driving your customers? Our key demographic live on social. Okay. I won't brand them all, but a lot of them do, right? Yeah. Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok is one of the up and coming ones. So you're, you're an avid user of TikTok, are you? I'm not. Okay. Being honest with you, I use it sometimes, but the guys in the office create content on there. Okay. Um, but yeah, you, you mentioned two things there, really. Um, it doesn't happen instantly. At month six, when I was still in recruitment, of starting the sole supply, I was at that point where I wanted to quit. Even though I've got this sort of resilient mindset, compared to some, it's not the most resilient, but I've got some resilience. Yeah. I wanted to stop because it wasn't getting any results. But then a few weeks after that, we got our first number one Google ranking for a popular shoe. And then the money started coming in because people were getting what they wanted. Mm. From that day, it changed. And that taught me exactly what you just said, which is be patient and stick with it. And it's fair to say that that principle, I mean, you've used that to your advantage as mm. a startup firm turned successful firm and continually growing. But that principle is the same of anyone who takes a job. And you'll see this from your recruiter experience in the past. Mm. We can't all get, if, we, if I'm new into industry or I'm in industry now, we don't always move for the perfect job, right? Yeah. We sometimes have to go into a company and prove ourselves and be patient to show our skills and our abilities until we might get promotion into the perfect job or those skills might redirect us to a job elsewhere. So being patient both as a business owner it mm. is as transferable to a job seeker. Would you agree there? Yeah, I wish more people had that mindset when they yeah. were going into somewhere. You said about having patience in your job. If you want to get further, then you need to, need to work hard for a year, two years. It could be longer. Really work hard and don't expect much from that. If the boss doesn't turn around after a year and give you a pay increase, keep going. You see what I mean? Yeah. With, with judgment, discretion. Don't stick it stick in that job for too long if it's yeah. really, you're not getting what you want. But I do think people are quite impatient generally. I think we are in yeah. a marketplace for talent where people will expect it now. And debatably, yeah. as much as you've used social media as your ally to grow your brand and your business, it also can be, I think, a it's instant artificial reality. Not, yeah. not your career isn't necessarily an instant thing. It's it's going to take time. It's so um, true. Yeah. What about your own staff? So you you've had to hire people on the way to get there, and I think every business is can be flawed if it doesn't have the right people in the company. Your vision can be great, your yeah. passion, your dedication, the hours you put in your idea could be perfect, but if you haven't mm. got the right people in your company, they can't enable you to achieve that. How have you found the hiring process since you've been the employer now and you've been bringing people on to do your development or whatever it might be? How have you found that? Yeah, um, that's a good question. And we were saying before, just before this about, you asked me, you know, do you know everyone? Have you hired everyone? I said, yeah. Right now we've got around 22 people in the company. And I think similar to you, you, you know everyone. Yeah. And you, you, you make it your goal to, to get to know them because you want to understand their values and their principles to make sure they're going to help you with your, your journey and your mission and the company mission. So, to, so what you're saying is, if I'm not wrong here, so despite the fact that you are the CEO and your role can be very busy looking at whatever facet of the company, mm. you're actively involved in making sure those appointments for your business are in line with what you want. Actively, yeah. Um, and you asked about how has it developed recruitment, the strategy. I've learned so much about hiring. Yeah. I thought I knew a lot when I was in recruitment for two years. I didn't know anything like I know now. Um, hiring people is the hardest thing. It's such a... There's an element of you can you can only do so much before they can get into that job yeah. and you can see on the job, right? Do you do you think? I absolutely agree. I yeah. Mean, there's a, I mean, let's just say it's a three stage interview process. You and you're involved in all of them. You only meet them three times. Yeah. And you're technically signing a contract if it's a permanent role for a <laughs> indefinite commitment, the future. right? So yeah. I've had three dates and now this is my wife yeah. or my husband or yeah, whatever yeah. it might be, right? Exactly. Um. So. To give confidence to people if they're a job seeker, mm. I guess it's fair to say that actually we might put pressure on ourselves to get a job if we want a job, but the pressure is just as much, if not greater and harder for the person trying to hire you. Yeah. Because I think as a company hiring, we can only really see your CV and your social media or whatever and get an assessment on you and interview. Yeah. But you can see everything about our company. You've got the website. You can speak to people that work for our firm. You really can do due diligence more on the firm than us on you as the employee. Yeah. Yeah, this is so true, yeah. And uh, researching the company you're going to interview for. Yeah. I know we're going into this, right? Yeah. But that's a huge thing you just mentioned there, doing your due diligence on the company. 
that you're going to see is so important so as well. If you could put a percentage on it, of all the people you've interviewed, whether it's for the sole supplier, even as a recruiter before, mm. what percentage of those people don't actually know enough about your company and they're just there for a job of that major? They haven't researched and they, they can't. Oh, could could you question. put a percentage on it? Um, 50%. So half of them don't know enough about your business that they're 50% don't understand that you need to. I try and I try and be very self-aware. Yeah. In the sense of, I don't need you to appease me. But what I'm, what a lot of companies and maybe recruiters may like, uh, not recruiters, but people hiring, um, is for you to make them feel good about their company or the position. Even them, if you know you're going to see John Smith, yeah. Um, look up John Smith and see what he's about. Right. I didn't come here without knowing stuff about you. I already knew about you from the apprentice days, right? For my sins, right? Yeah, for your oh, <laughs> and the wrestling. Yeah, true. <laughs> a range of different things. Yeah. Um, you've got to Mike. know who you. You've got to know who you're talking mm. to. That's number one. Um, too many people undervalue that. I think yeah. and think it's all about what uh, them, but match up what you can offer to what that company's about, and you're going to win. And without, and I agree everything you're saying, without putting words in your mouth, and I, yeah. I'd like to think you, but if we're saying 50% of people aren't doing that, yeah. and let's not make this overcomplicate, all we're asking you to do is know a bit more about our company and the people involved and mm. have, a, have a connection, right? That's right. It's not unfair to say that of those 50%, 100% of those 50% you, prob you won't hire. Have you hired anyone in that 50% who haven't done the research? That, I guess that's my question. It really depends on the role okay. because for say the technical roles, there's some developers that have been amazing people, they fit with the values and principles that we're looking for, and they're skillful, but they don't really love trainers. Okay. They just know the industry. And that I can understand. And that f they're passionate about product development, yeah. website or app. And that's their passion, they think of great things. And it has paid off. Our development team, we haven't, and nobody's left the development team. Yeah. We've only had to let pe ask people to leave the development team or end contracts. What about, I'm gonna pose a question because I, yeah. I know where you're coming. Only with that role, really, yeah, but, but uh, content they need to I know. I think to yeah. an extent, long yeah. term, yeah. I don't know how well that'll work. And the reason I say this, I think, when you set up a firm of a young entrepreneur, there is an element of you are going to hire skills that fit what you need the role to do. So if they're an mm. expert in their field, an expert product developer, that's what you need, not an interest in the trainers necessarily. However, if you've got someone who's an expert product developer that also loved the trainers or loved what you stood for, that yeah. would still be the person you hire. So I think as a, as a younger business, you, went, you do hire some roles functionally, which is yes. what that is. But as the business scales and you probably get more interest from more people, you end up hiring the people that actually have research it and do care for it so agreed and this I is a very small percentage by the it way is. i will make an exception if you can see it's going to work for yeah. what the current needs are for the certain features that may need to be built but even that if they're yeah. researching what the current needs are for what they they have done some research into maybe what you need so there is an element of research in there and i guess what i'm saying is even if you're getting hired and you don't know enough about firm you get the job mm. i don't think there are so few jobs where people will hire that way because an established business will hire on competency value behavioral as well as technical a yeah. younger business sometimes the right person for the right job but as your business grows you'll probably hire less and less of them and i think if 50 percent of the marketplace isn't research and not getting the jobs yeah best bit of advice for everyone is research the company you're on the better 50 percent there that's and so you've got true. a better chance at getting a job yeah it's such a simple thing isn't it and that's half the job seekers that you can not worry about as being competition anymore because they're not being good enough what's been the and i'll ask you some of these in our quick fire at the end of yeah, this pod but looking um, forward to that what's been the worst thing that's ever happened to you in an interview let's think about it. someone's turned up mm. you've taken your time to interview them you've looked at the cv <laughs> or someone else or however that's done they've sat in front what's the worst thing you've ever seen at an interview um I've seen something funny where a guy turns up in a full suit and three piece. Yeah. That was pretty funny because we're a casual business and we're a trainer company. Um, the worst thing. Did you hire them? Um, no. <laughs> it just didn't. It was, he was a creative as well, okay. this guy. He's a really nice guy, but it just, that's like, we're, we're, you know. Yeah. You could have asked the dress code, by the mm. way. If you're not sure about dress code, you can ask. Yeah. Definitely. Don't not ask and turn up in the wrong thing because 
you're going to stick out. Ironically, as a recruiter in 15 years, I've only been asked that question three times by my candidates. Yeah. Three, whether I'm given the information, not all the time, three times in 15 years has someone asked me that, and you're right, turn yeah. up in a three-piece to a creative, right, might not work. Yeah, and it seems very Unless obvious. Unless you're wearing trainers at the bottom and you're clearly starting with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you're one of those hipster dudes, yeah. right? Yeah. Then you're from Shoreditch. Uh, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, the funniest, or the, the craziest, someone talking about the World War, Okay. And, uh, you know, Germany in the war. The stuff like that. That was one of the crazy... They're quite opinionated on it as well. Very opinionated. Like, um, awkward moments three times. Okay. And I was like, wow, you haven't been self-aware enough to realise you need to stop saying that. Yeah. And he didn't know the guy that I was sitting with who was interviewing. Um, or he saw the guy, that, that one of our guys, um, had relations and stuff like that. And it was so bad. Yeah. I was like, you can't... This is not a topic yeah. you mention, you know? It's like they say, don't mention, talk about religion, politics, and yeah. something in the pub, because it always creates arguments. Like, I don't say mention that. Avoid the ist, sexist, racist, ageist, anything that yeah. you can put an ist on World the end. Of, don't talk about well, warist, yeah, don't put that on there. <laughs> yeah. um, warist. So, mm. okay, that's where I think it's. I asked the question about the interview, not to try and make people worry that they have to not do anything in an interview or be a bit opinionated or a bit individual, but that a lot of people do get this point wrong and what you're looking for is if the researcher come but they realize you're a casual brand. Yeah. Um, I won't lie, when, when in the last six months my business has moved from what I'd call a, a startup office to an established company office and we've gone in an office a bit more of a fun, you, you obviously here, you've seen the running track and stuff mm. like that. The first day I turned up in my office as a recruiter of professional market, suit and tie, was the first time I felt like I was I was actually no longer in my company because I felt like I was a little bit reserved, yeah. a little bit, I'm in the wrong office here. Mm. Hence why I see the point that you're making. So let's get people to research a company. Let's get people to ask about the dress code. Let's yeah. get people to be more self-aware. Yeah. Let's go back a step. So that's people in an interview and that's making an assessment on somebody. Um, what about their CV? Um, what, what stands out to you? Because you've got to look at a CV to get an interview. And yeah. I say CVs are words on a paper. The person who gets the job is the person that turns up an interview. But what, what, what's what been good or bad on CVs for you today? Okay, where are you going to be going to interview? What okay. type of business is it? If it's a creative industry, then there's going to be creative people in that business. Not all of them, but even yeah. the strategy people, the seniors, that's going to have some focus in that market. They know what good design looks like. I'm not saying get your CV designed in a crazy way, yeah. I'm saying make sure it's laid out clearly, very clearly with the right spacing. It's not, you know, yeah. way too many words on one page. Nice spacing, so it's breathing. The, the text can breathe. Um, minimal color scheme, you know, maybe just a, a light pastel accent color yeah. at, at max. And that's going to give that first impression when you're swiping through a pile. Oh, that's a nice looking CV. Yeah. And then the key information at the top, key achievements, key skills. Again, it depends on the role. If you're a senior person, I want to see a few good company names straight away yeah. that you work for. Yeah, at the top. Okay. Well, I think the thing that I like that you said, and I'm actually going to take this, it doesn't, it applies to anything that's non-creative as well. Hmm. Recruiters, hiring managers, whoever, can be going through piles of CVs. You said that when I'm flipping through my CVs, yeah. I want to see a nice one. One thing we're looking for is you to stand out. In my opinion, that isn't, loads of color, loads of pictures, loads of logos. It is mm. what looks neat, what looks easy to read, and what looks like it could be engaging. So that's the first thing you've looked for, is the text breathable? And I, I've never heard that term, and I'm yeah, just it's a funny that term. term, yeah. I like it, because I, the amount of space I leave between things, people say, why don't you put it on, on one? I said, because it's too hard to read, it's a lot of text, I've got to break it up for you, right? Yeah, the mind um, goes into, whoa. And the second thing that. you've shared, and actually I think this is the thing most job seekers miss, is the key achievements. Yeah. How many CVs? Because we're time poor, right? Correctly. How many yeah. CVs actually just are a replication of a job description? I do this. I do the accounts. I do the marketing. How many CVs actually tell you what someone's done really, really well? And that's the achievement section, which is yeah. I delivered this project on time in budget. This is the impact it had to the company. Oh, and you're like, that's that's great. Yeah. Let's talk to this person. Um, one of the questions as well before that we spoke about was. Um, So just to do with achievements yeah. on the CV. Uh, and actually, what's, how do you know when you take it to the face-to-face? -face? Okay. Well, for me, if they've got key achievements at the top, yeah. and there's a couple of things that stand out, I can get a face-to-face -face straight off the back of that. Okay. And they've got consistent experience. Yeah. And they're not jumping everywhere. Those two things. A few key achievements. Oh, they've been at two good companies for a while. Cool, let's get them in. Okay. 
That's great. I can, I can be that quick sometimes to do a face-to-face because face-to-face is best. Do you know the funny thing is there, and, 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 I, and I talk about this a lot, decisions on CVs are made very quickly, whether people like to hear that or not. People yes. will, make, will make snap judgments on a CV, and I always, I always word CVs. If anyone's ever seen the film The Matrix, and I might be showing my age here, <laughs> oh, when they're it. looking in The Matrix, Classic. they've got a coded screen, and it's all gobbledygook to most people, and they're like, I can actually see pictures and people in that. Yeah. I think anyone with a good eye for hiring does that with a CV. I can see the person off the back of the words on the CV. I like that analogy. It's The Matrix. I like that. I said That's it to good. someone that worked for me the other day, and I hadn't heard of The Matrix, and I, I couldn't believe how out of date I was. But haven't you're just look at, I know it's mad, isn't it? What? But you've just looked for two simple things. You look yeah. for key achievements yep. and some consistency in workforce. And that's got the interview. I mean, yeah. how yeah. that's probably the easiest anyone's ever explain what they look for on a CV. Yeah. I mean, it has to be relevant and in the context of what you're hiring, but that all to one side. Mm. Um, how we how much easier is that for someone to get a job if it's simple, if it's straightforward? And achievements, in my opinion, tell us what you've done really well. Yeah. A job, uh, a um, the duties of your job tell us what you do, and we don't hire doers. We hire people who are great because our businesses we think are great, and we want them to continually be great. Yeah, I think as well. If you haven't got any achievements, if there's anyone out there and you're just yeah. starting out, show me what you're passionate about in that top section. I don't want to see I'm a positive, enthusiastic individual who that's that's classic. Yeah. And anyone out there who's put that needs to update it. You need to say something like, you know, in my spare time. Um, I, I do this, this, and this, and this helps me in this way. So interesting. You want to see, you, you like to see that in actually right at the top. Because I'm a big believer in if they're brand interest, new, if they're brand new, if they're okay. brand new and they don't have anything to offer. If you haven't got real recruitment history yeah. or uh, employment history, then you need to show something that's going to make that employer think this guy, this person's really interesting, yeah. and they've got passion. Passion's key, isn't it, for it new is. people? Yeah. What are you passionate about? And that's the first yeah. time everyone's ever articulated that. I'm a big believer of hobbies and interests are so powerful. Yeah. I actually read one the other day. Someone applied to us, and I'm sorry for if anybody listens to this, it was that person. I'm not going to say their names. So yeah, know. yeah. The most the most engaging thing about them in their hobbies and interests is they like reading. Mm. I've got nothing wrong with people that read, and I know you want people to read because they want them to read your contact to go onto your platform and then ultimately yeah. buy through the platform. Read but books. Actually. That said, yeah. what are you reading? Mm. Um, what are you interested? Why are you interested? I mean. I've gone to the hobbies and interest to pull that out and I've deemed that to be boring and I'm less interested because I don't hire boring people. But as a new hire, if they put something interesting about it at the top, I've never heard someone say put the hobbies in the top for a new hire. That is such a great way of putting it. Yeah, I guess a brand new person, you definitely want to know. Yeah. yeah, If they say something like, I've just read this book, um, you know, the, the Netflix book, which yeah. I, I just read. It was a great book. I gained this, this and this from it. I'm looking to do this in, in, in my career. I'm like, wow, that's, that's, I like that. It just gives you a little insight into them, I guess. A snap judgment. I like that. Yeah. What I would caveat that with yeah. is don't just put that on there to get your interview to anyone. Listen to that. If you put something on that's there true. at that point that's personal, yeah. be prepared to be asked questions on it, be prepared to be challenged on it, and be prepared that the person you're interviewing with has probably read it as well and might oh, know yeah. it, and if they'll catch you out. So this don't, this don't really, I want to ask you because that... The apprentice interviews are some yeah. of the most ruthless interviews, right? Absolutely, yeah. Are they as tough as they seem on the telly? They are, <laughs> and I'll say this humbly, they are real interviews. They're yeah. 45 minute interviews, so slightly short, but they're real interviews. Yeah. They are as tough as you see. I love However, that stage. Yeah. And they're probably slightly artificial as a result of being slightly more one-sided. And uh, to everyone out there, interviews aren't quite like The Apprentice, yeah. that you just get assassinated. Yeah. That is a example of, um, pressurized interview on steroids and yeah. makes great TV. Great and actually, TV. they're putting a two hundred and fifty thousand pound investment. They want to get strong people for. I get that, mm. but um, there are parts of it which are completely fair, honest, two way interview, and I get to chance to challenge it. But going into the Apprentice, and this should be the same. I'm going in an interview. I know that was the format. I've made the conscious decision that that's going to be a tough interview. It's going to be hard work. And I had the choice to not apply as a result of it. Mm. I've also seen it before and therefore I've done my research to see the type of things they ask. If I'm not smart enough to try and make sure that there's no holes in everything that I say off the back of how they do that, then I should be absolutely torn apart in that interview. And the only thing I'll add on top of that, I was prepared for it and I was happy to go into it. But I really, really want to labour the point that real life interviews, despite parts of it are two way, real life interviews aren't as hard as the apprentice interview anyone's ever seen that. Please don't Agreed. let that ever put you off applying to a job. Um, let that be 
worst, 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 worst case scenario. And if you're prepared for that, then you'll be you, you'll nail your interview. I agree with you. Yeah, you, what you said about them being one sided, mm. definitely, because in our interviews, we want to have a conversation where we can connect as well. Yeah, um, I try and keep the interviews now very formal. So okay. when I say formal, I still want to get to know you. But what I'm aiming to do is, is not be biased to my own belief or first impression. Yeah, I want to ask you questions that I probably laid out before. Um, so I, I can answer them and I can compare them across across candidates. So I would say to anyone that is going into an interview, aim to throw questions in naturally into that interview yeah. rather than let them ask at the end, have you got any questions? And then you're like, uh, well, yeah, I've got this one. Yeah. And you actually say, well, I've, I've asked a lot of the questions. They'll know that you've asked a lot. Yeah. That's really powerful when someone just fires one back. Oh, by the way, how does that work in the business? I'm like, yeah, let me tell you. I think something to add to that, because I, yeah. I always say you have to ask questions. And I was actually going to ask you, do you think people should ask throughout or at the end? Oh, really? And you've answered that for me yeah, already. Funny is that? Yeah. But I would say to you, if you if you go down the approach of asking questions throughout, mm. and I'm an absolute advocate, that's what you should do. Mm. If the interviewer pushes you back and says, no, no, you can do the questions at the end, you have a conscious decision knowing that that's how they treat you in an interview. That's a good point. That's how they might treat you when you work there. Mm. So please be aware if that happens to you, you've got the opportunity to make a decision. Say this company is, is very, very structured. I speak, I can only speak when I'm, when I'm allowed to speak. Um, you're informed enough to say whether it culturally works for you. Because I think what people forget in interviews is not just there are two ways. You, you've agreed with me. I think a lot of people are getting that. But you should be asked, you're assessing the interviewer. And that interview Agreed. is representing their company's brand yes. um, to you. And if they don't sell themselves to you, I'm not saying they have to get on the hands and knees and sell the business to you. But what I'm saying to you, if you don't warm to the person in the interview room, yeah. you might not warm to the firm. And even if that's an unfair judgment because that person was a bad interviewer, yeah. you're still a brand ambassador for their firm. And you would want, as an employer, everyone that interviews for you if you're not there to, to do it as well as you and be as, be as brand reflective as you are, presumably. Yeah, so true. Yeah. You are assessing the interviewer. Yeah. Yeah. Some people, again, will just jump at the job. Again, if, you're, if you need the job, then I understand it. But if you've got opportunities, then really think about those company values, yeah. Okay, and yeah. Um, I'm gonna take this a step further. Mm. So we've had a little look at some CVs, what good can look like. I've had a look at some interviews, probably what bad can look like. Um, <laughs> actually, I'll ask you one more question, the interview would be unfair. I asked you before what some of the worst things that happened in the interview. What's some of the best things? Where has someone really, really impressed you in an interview and you're like, I just have to hire them? Um. So one guy with a CV, actually, um, he took our website design in the early days when we were looking for a writer and he, he modified his CV to be like the, a product page on the website, on the, one on of the your, shopping pages. In line with your brand. In line, yeah, and then his CV was landscape and he had a, a, a profile picture of him and his experience down the right and then, you know, where the price and style, it was, it was great. So yeah. that was one way to stand out as a creative, as a writer, brilliant yeah um, in interviews first impression and being polite and transparent is probably the thing that I love the most okay. when someone's just you can tell they're they're just an honest and open person it's quite a hard thing to do because people close up yeah they and they they answer and say things that they think they want to hear yeah um, again what you said about is that the right company for you if you do that if you're not your true self in the interview and you're, 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 you're acting, mm. you're going to get found out as well. So don't do that. Be the true version of you. And that, will, that interview will be on fire most of the time if you connect with someone similar. And, and absolutely 100% yeah. agree. Allow yourself the opportunity to open up yeah. and get your personality across. I mean, don't. I mean, when I was in my wrestling days, I probably wouldn't have stripped down to my wrestling kit and got that personality across. That might have been inappropriate. However, did you um, share that though with people? Oh, because that's oh, an interesting. Could you imagine that was all over my hobbies and interest? All the guys in America wrestling. I'd wrestled against, Pro and every time, whether people loved it, hated it, laughed or whatever, it was a talking point and it broke the ice. Got it. Um, but I guess what I was going to lead on to is be yourself as much as you can in the interview. Be confident using your term. Mm. That interview will be on fire. You'll be on fire if you do that. Mm. If you don't get the job and you've done that, don't let it put you off. Because what you might realize is actually the personalities weren't right anyway. Mm. And actually, if you had got the job there and they didn't like what they saw, you're not going to enjoy it anyway. So point. be yourself. And if it doesn't work, don't let it knock you back. 
Um, Agreed. Just don't be Ricky in his wrestling pants over the top, but be yourself and be <laughs> open and be on fire. I'm yeah. Use that term. Yeah. Um, so the next step forward is you've looked at the CVs. We know what good looks like. You've interviewed. You, you've liked the person. You, you've made the appointment. Mm-hmm. What's the best thing they can do once they start with you to make a good impression? Because that's a very di- that, when you onboard into a company, you're now there. You're now part of the not say furniture. That's unfair. You're part of the culture. Um, what's the best way that they can impress you as a hire and therefore their employer? In the early stages, when you yeah. first get employed, your reputation is everything. I'd say twelve months of good reputation, and don't then try and get a bad rep. Yeah, but um, in the industries that we're in, in both industries, um, there's there's a lot of social events, let's say, and opportunities to go out. Don't let yourself down in those early stages. Yeah. Don't go on the company drinks if you join in December at Christmas, and then go out and get. You know, so drunk yeah. that you embarrass yourself, you will be known as that guy for your future at that company. So make sure that you hold the best reputation possible. You've definitely got a story there. You know, someone who's done something at of some course. Christmas event that of I course. won't put you in a position to share. Of course I do. You're so right as yeah. well. Um, but it's a problem for everyone, right? You have, yeah. to, you have to hold it down because you want to be known as... You want, you want integrity and you want a okay. good reputation. It's really important. You don't want to be branded by your bosses or managers. So the best people I've seen, they keep their head down. Yeah. Um, and they even take a while to come out of their shell. You're like, I thought you were sociable. Mm. They're just keeping their head down for a few weeks. Yeah. Not talking too much, getting on with it. And they start getting out of their shell. And that's really nice as well. Let's bring that back to what we said earlier. Be patient. You yeah. be patient with your business. Be patient with your jobs. And but the patience prevails from a perspective that I've hired people that have, uh, that have done something very stupid in the first month or two. And I won't lie, they've ended up in my. Um, I won't swear, but my um, my bad box. They've ended yeah. up in that box, and it's and I've had to get over that because they've been able to prove themselves after that. But it wasn't the best start. So agreed. Be patient. Don't expect it on the plate, and integrate yourself with the business. But don't try and be life and soul the minute you turn up because nobody wants someone to take over when they don't have the internal credentials to do so. It's really funny. There's a program called 60 Days okay. um, on Netflix or Amazon Prime um, where they put people that aren't criminals into jails. 60 Days In, I watched 60 it Days In, it's great. Yeah. It really hooked me in that one. Um, but that's the same principle. Yeah. When they go into the jail, the ones that are the most successful and blend in are the ones that keep their head down yeah. initially and then they open up. The ones that go in, all guns blazing, like yeah. the life, of the life of the room, they get they get absolutely shot down. So I think people should watch Sixty Days in. I'm not, <laughs> we're not promoting any. any yeah. I think it's a Netflix program here, but that is in its rawest sense, right? Yeah. In its rawest sense, you are you are law abiding citizens put into put into a prison. Yeah. You're a convict. No convicts know that, and no jail warden knows that, and you have to integrate into that society. Yeah. And you'd never do that if you were. You're going into a place where people are very close mm. and even more so ruthless in a prison. But in a workplace, people, if it's a good team, I'm very happy to say our team's stuck together for a long time. It's a great team and it can be kind of, you want to get in there and yeah, you just want to blend yeah. in and, and slowly but surely, because no one wants someone to start. You know. Well, let's, um, yeah. on a lighter note, the yeah. good news is no one's going into jail no. and taking a new job no. with an employer. <laughs> so if you watch that and realise, God, how have they manoeuvred that socially and politically in the prison? Yeah. Um, you never have to do anything that's bad in the workforce. The workforce, want, they've hired you. They want it to work for you as much as you want it to work for you. And just, just believe in that. Um, anything else that you think is worth it? Because I know we've spoken a lot. And I'm going to ask you, I guess, two extra things, both on the soul supply, your future and what you're looking to do. And secondly, any other useful tips and tricks to um, any job seekers. So let's look at, we'll end with the soul supply. Let's look at, is there any extra bits of advice you can give to anybody that's job seeking, looking for work, or anybody that's looking to hire people? Any last bits of advice you can give them that you think is a great take home? So one thing is, if you've, so our stage, our process for hiring is, look for CV, start shortlisting. Um, Telephone interview face-to-face, maybe a test if you're technical, yeah, and then you're in. Or maybe one more face-to-face. We interview individually, so okay. we get a lot done in that one face-to-face. If you've got a telephone interview, have confidence to know that your CV was good enough, mm. if you've been honest. And that should help you, because like you just said, they've chosen you because they like Correct. you so yeah. far. And it's like that in every stage. Telephone interview, you've got to a face-to-face, they like what you said on the phone, and they like your CV. 
have confidence. Do not doubt yourself. That's the biggest thing that I see newer people to, to employment yeah. have. It's like, oh, I'm not that confident in... You got here out of your own merit. Um, so that is one major thing. So let each stage of that pro, the recruitment Boost process you, build your confidence. Build you more, yeah. yeah. And um, just the resilience and this mindset of people say, uh, it can be older people sometimes, they say, you know, my, my, my mum and dad's aging friends, there's no mm. jobs out there. You know, Jimmy can't get a job. Yeah. Like, there's loads of jobs out there. With all this social media, there are loads of jobs. Agreed. So believe that there are a lot of jobs because otherwise you're not gonna, you're not gonna take the actions each day to, to get where yeah. you need to be. Um, you're not going to look at the right platforms because you believe that there's not a lot of opportunity. I like that. That's, yeah. That is really comforting. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to summarise when we conclude. But mm. let's think about the future for you. Yeah. You're, you've got to a position where you've done extremely well and I think a really hard marketplace Thanks. and a very expensive marketplace to get to. What does the future look like for the sole supplier? So when I started the sole supplier, the casual footwear market wasn't like it is today. It's grown massively. I got in before the curve, mm. grew it, self-funded for five years up until now. Um, and like you mentioned, 70% year on year growth, which is amazing to me. I'm so happy and thankful. Now I'm looking to grow aggressively and really capitalize on this market. Okay. It's going to grow by, I think, 30%, 40% to 2025. Wow. The casual trainer market. It's 86 billion from 56. So our next stage is to look for investment very soon. Okay. So that is what I'm putting out there. I'm speaking to different people. Yeah. But like you said, you've got to choose the right person. Absolutely. Just like you've got to choose the right company if you're going to, to find a job. Yeah. I've got to make sure they're right for me. It's not just about the, the funding. It's about getting that person that can offer knowledge and take us to the next level. Well, I wish you good luck. And what I'll always say is somebody who has gone and found investment and speaks about, there's actually lots of money out there if you look close enough. So what you need is somebody mm. who can add extra value than just the cash to, to what you're doing next. And yeah. I'm excited for the future, you guys. And I spoke to you already. I'm now a follower on all your platforms. Appreciate that. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to be, I'm very untrendy. So I'm going to be looking to buy a decent pair of trainers at some point soon. And that's where I'm going to use you as my trainer coach because you are the CEO of the Soul Supply. I'm here to help. Yeah, I know what size you are, 10.5. <laughs> We're in. Um, and yeah, we aim to just be the only place you need to find your latest and greatest pair of trainers. I like it. Well, thank you. And some of the take homes that I think people can take away in the process is, um, if I summarize some of the bits is, be patient when you get a job. Mm. Um, it will build, stick with it. The longer you're with it for a period of time without asking for everything in return from the employer, the better. They're building your career. Secondly, if you're going through a recruitment process, if you keep getting invited back, see that as a confidence boost. It's like a funnel. Each stage has less people in it, so you are a bigger percentage at each stage you move on, be happy. Mm. Um, and ultimately, from your side, take confidence as jobs out there. Mm. You might have to keep applying, and they might not all be the perfect job, but there are jobs out there, so keep going. And honest and integrity. Honesty and integrity. Yeah, it's so key. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank Thanks, you very Ricky. much. Right, good to see you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Nice one.